Okay. Well, welcome, guys. How are we going to do this morning? Good. Good. All right. Well, we have a great guest speaker with us today, like you guys know. Through his video series and his CBC interviews, we have introduced my great fives to Isaac Crosby here. We know a little bit about your family. We know a little bit about what you do at the Evergreen Brickworks. And we're excited to talk to you today. And we look forward to working with you throughout this year as we learn more about Indigenous farming, sustainable farming, and just learning more about uh, what you do there. So we are going to give a great round of applause and welcome. Hey. So Isaac, we just want to know a little bit about yourself and what you, oh, let me get into the picture in here. A little bit about yourself and what you do at uh, Evergreen. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you're nice and alive this morning after your recess. That's kind of fun. So once again, my name is Isaac Crosby. I come from the Ojibwa of Antonin from southwestern Ontario. Um, we are known as the darker hue of the Native Nation or as Afro-Indigenous, which just means that we are the ones that mixed, married, and mingled with the enslaved people that ran north to Canada for freedom. So back home in southwestern Ontario, I come from a farming family, so I grew up on a farm in the half an hour south of Windsor. And I've been doing it farming all my life. I've done various jobs, various careers, but I've always came back to farming. And so about 10 years ago, I decided to go back to school, started teaching, started teaching, started learning about landscape horticultural technician, and started doing that, but need to, needed to include my indigenous knowledge as well. So that, that, that got me a job at Green, Green Thumbs Growing Kids in downtown Toronto. I worked with them for a while. So working with, working with school grounds, greening schools, having gardens at schools. I had three schools I took, I took care of where I taught the, taught the students how to, how to garden. Then to get me here at Evergreen Brickworks. So I've been here for about, no, I've been here for five years, actually. Five years on the dot, on the nose. Um, I started out as a programmer, but quickly fell into the gardening role because of my, my background, my schooling, and never looked back after that. So here at Evergreen Brickworks, I started as a programmer, became the urban agricultural lead hand, and now I'm the horticultural lead, and I still do urban agriculture. So just in case you don't know what urban agriculture is, it's the, it's the ability to grow food in the city. So if you live in a city and you're growing food in your backyard, you're doing urban agriculture. And everyone loves to grow food because everyone loves to eat. So here at Brickworks, I do a number of things. Um, besides my indigenous programming, so working with the indigenous people around here, um, within the, within the um, uh, downtown, sorry, the Toronto, city of Toronto, and working with non-indigenous people as well, and teaching them about indigenous agricultural techniques. And I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, if not doing that, I also have worm wranglers. So worm wranglers, we see the signs behind me. Yeah. Worm wranglers is all about using using worms. So the worm, the worm poo, vermicompost, is what we'll use for our garden here. I do not use any chemicals, any man-made chemicals on my garden, so it's all pesticide and chemical free. And we, one thing we also do is we'll soak our seeds in water, sometimes with um, milkweed root or mayapple root. And that, what that will do is that it will take on the, the toxic substance of the milkweed. So when a bird comes to try to eat the seed, they taste how bitter that seed tastes and they'll, they'll spit it out. So they save your seeds. Um, so like I said, we're using vermicompost, compost, um, doing indigenous agricultural techniques such as the Three Sisters. Have you guys ever heard of the Three Sisters before? Okay, is it, I have a question for you. Are the three sisters potatoes, squash, and turnips? No. Okay. Um, is it watermelon, honeydew, and strawberries? No. Okay, is it corn, beans, and squash? Yes. <laughs> wow, nice one. All it right. Is, so. is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I'm going to teach you guys a few more things about the three sisters. Because back home in my, in my community, on our farm, we would do the three sisters that you know of, the corn, beans, and squash. We call them, we call them the trendy sisters, the, the, um, the superfood sisters, because when you have those three, three vegetables together, you make one complete protein. All right, so we do corn, beans, and squash. And if we think our soil is contaminated, we'll, do, we'll use sunflowers instead of corn, because sunflowers will help decontaminate the soil. 
If we think our soil is too compact, very, very hard to break, what we'll do is we'll put, we'll put um, sun root or sun choke in it. People don't, you probably don't know it as sun choke. You probably know it or seen it or heard it as Jerusalem artichoke. Um, it's not from Jerusalem, it's not an artichoke. It's actually part of the sun, the sunflower family. And so we put that in the ground. What, that, what she will do is she will send her roots out and in her root she has little nodules which are actually the sun choke, the tuber. And what will happen is she'll start growing, growing, growing and she pushes the soil around. So she decompacts our soil for us. So we do, we do various techniques and those techniques I actually bring here on Brickwork, do Brickworks into various sites around the city. One thing we do is a thing called, I grew up doing clay pot irrigation which is one thing that I make sure people learn about because we are in we are in a climate change where our summers are very, very hot. And when it comes to gardening, you really need to know where your water is coming from. So what we do, I'll show you one example of it, is clay pot irrigation. So this right here used to be a clay pot, or the clay pot for using flowers in. So all I did is I flipped it upside down, I took the saucer, Put the, glued the saucer to the rim of the, of the clay pot. Make sure I left the hole on top right there. So this whole thing is gonna go into the ground. And all you're gonna see is just maybe one inch at the top. And sometimes you'll paint them so you can actually see them. And all you do now is you put your water inside that hole, fill this whole thing up with water, put a rock on top of there so it does not evaporate. And now that it's in the ground, what happens is that the roots of the plants will start working their way towards the water source. And they'll start, they will drink when they need to drink. You can do this with a single one like this or do a double one. We have two, two of these, one here, one here. If you're, doing, if you're doing great big mounds. So that comes to the mounds. Have you guys ever seen pictures or heard of indigenous mounds for gardening? That's no? A no. <laughs> I get it, I get it. So what it is, indigenous mounds for gardening is basically creating a nice big mound. And we do that to help to, for the three sisters, because you, you put, you, Make a great big mound about three feet high, three feet high, four feet across. And what you do, you take one of these, you put that in the middle, you have all your soil around it, all right? And then now what you do is you plant your, your corn seeds. So you can plant your three sisters. The corn seeds go around there. She starts growing, she's growing nice and tall. Now that she's tall, she needs some food. So corn needs a lot of nitrogen. That's why you plant the beans around the corn. So sister bean, what she does is she feeds sister corn. What she does, she has to open her leaves, and in her leaves, she starts capturing nitrogen from the air, and she stores it down, down her stem into the ground called nitrogen nodules. And those nitrogen nodules are next to sister corn's roots, who will tap into the nitrogen nodules, nodules and start growing nice and big. So when they're growing nice and big, sister, sister, sister bean needs something to grow, grow around, so she travels around sister corn. Now you have a problem with the, with the rabbits and the, the raccoons coming to eat them. Now you plant Sister Squash. She's the warrior sister. So she's on the ground. She's getting fed as well. She has nice big leaves on her stem. She has these barbs on there. And so when, a, when the, the rabbits come and they step on it with their fleshy paws, they run away, right? So that's what we do when we're doing our mound. We're doing our clay pot irrigation with our three sisters. I mean, we also do a, a one called Circle in the Square when it comes to gardening as well. So when we're doing that, we're doing a lot more companion plants. So companion plants are plants that actually complement each other, like the three sisters complement each other. Okay. So when we're when I'm growing, I grow I grow a lot of stuff here at Brickworks. So one year I I grew a lot of corn. One year I grew I grew rice. I showed people here how to grow rice here because someone told me that they, they would love to grow rice in Canada because I lived in Thailand when I was like 19 years old. I learned how to grow rice. So I learned how to grow rice here, which is a lot of fun. And then going, taking a lot of traditional foods and bringing traditional foods back to the, to the city center and to the, to the native people. I'm going to show you a few examples of things I also do here at Brickworks. And I'm going to take you outside for a quick tour of my gardens. So you can see, even though they're covered in snow, you have a general idea of the, of the land I take, I take care of here. So when it comes to talking about, we talked about corn. I'm going to show you examples of the corn that actually grew here on site. So I have this corn right here, the white corn. So I grew... So I think I had about this year, we had about maybe 150 years of corn growing on the site. So a lot of white corn, which is great for making cornmeal. But if you look at the top right here, I was showing people how to actually take the corn husk and make them into flowers, which I learned from my, grand, my grandmother when I, was, when I was a young a young lad, a young guy. So I showed them how to make them into flowers. Just like when you hang your corn up for it to dry, at least it looks nice. 
At least it looks kind of cute or pretty. Let's hang it there looking nice, right? So what it is, if you know the corn leaves, so that the ears of the corn have these leaves around it, right? So they wrap around the whole corn. It's those leaves. So the leaves, I, I let them get almost brown, but still I can still bend them. And what you'll do is that you bend the leaves over like this, right? Just bend it over like that. And you'll fold it, fold it, fold it in the first one very, very tight. As you can see inside there, it's very, very tight. But all you keep doing is keep taking those leaves, fold them over and wrap them around, wrap them around, wrap them around. And then you will end up making a flower that looks like this. So what I want to do this year is actually make a bunch of those and dye them red and orange for the missing murdered women and children. Nice. I'm also teaching people how to how to make seed bombs. You guys ever hear about seed bombs before? No. Okay, so seed bombs, what they are, are just, just look like this: the clay compost and mixed with seeds. And the great thing about this is that you can, when you make these and they dry out, and you want where wherever you want to plant plant your plants, you just take this ball right here and you just toss it, boom, where you want it. Toss it where you want it. When you come back, you start seeing plants growing where, wherever you toss these bombs at. So this is a lot of fun because you get a lot. You actually get a lot of adults that come down here and we make these, and they, they actually have a lot of fun doing them. Um, they like getting they like getting dirty with their hands. I mean, it's fun, right? And it's a fun for us to, to sit back and toss them and see and see what grows the next year. So one thing I want to show you, but what I do here as well is I like to like to push the envelope and try different things. So a couple of minutes ago, I was talking about the plant called the sunroot or sun choke or Jerusalem, Jerusalem agar, um, artichoke. So one thing we're going to do, we're doing here this year is making bricks. So people know bricks as making, using cement, making brick houses. So being here at Evergreen Brick Works, where bricks were made for the city of Toronto, I realized that there is no showcase on how the bricks were made here and how bricks of the future are going to be made. So bricks of the future are going to be made with, with plants, with hempcrete, with sunflowers, with sun choke. So we're already doing ones here at Brickworks with suncrete or sun chokes. And these bricks oy, are looking like this. <laughs> like what? They look like compost, they said. Like compost? Awesome! So what you see is actually going to be in, in the inside of the bricks. So that's all the rough. So the, the, the sun truck was cut up nice and rough. We put our clay, our lime, our water, mixed it to get all the stuff together, made it nice and solid, put it in a nice little case, and then we let it dry. So we're going to do now, we're going to make about 35 of those and build a wall, but over top of those, over top of those bricks, we're going to do another layer, not if I can speak, layer of smooth clay. We're going to smooth those bricks out. Then we're going to stack them all together and showcase how you can actually make bricks out of plants, especially sun choke and sunflowers, which are actually a lot better than hempcrete, okay? And a fire resistance, antifungual, no, no insects. It's actually perfect for your for your home, but the only the only issue is that the bricks are kind of thick. It's the only issue. But hey, we can figure that out as time goes on. So this right here. Uh, is that a water bottle? Is that a beetroot? Hey, well, yeah. Let's listen. Let's listen. Is it an onion? So you're right. Who said water bottle? This is a water bottle gourd. So all you got to do, I grew these on site. All you do is you take the top off right here, take the seeds out, then you fill this with water and carry this around as a water bottle. Or at the, the um, Walpole Island First Nation, they grow a lot of these. They use these as bird houses for birds. Let's carve a hole right here, and the birds can come and go as they please. So they grow these two as well on site, which are kind of cool because you'll see them just hanging, just hanging there, right? And people walk by like, what's that? Is it going to drop on my head? Go, no, it's just, it's, um, it's a it's a gourd that we're gonna use for for maybe a water bottle or maybe we're gonna use that for a birdhouse. I don't know yet, but I just want to love to grow them to show something different. And so so that you so that youth can see different kinds of things we grow within within North America that are actually from North America. Because I realize I realize here when I talk to youth who are even indigenous youth, they don't know a lot of foods and stuff that actually come from the Americas. So that's one of my goals to make sure that. People know what foods come from here, what foods did not come from here. 
from the, from the Americas. So when I say the Americas, I'm talking about North America, Central America, and South America. All the Americas have all the different kinds of foods that they've shared for all for a long, long time. Um, I also teach, I also do a thing on hydroponics, how to use old uh, pop bottles, two liter pop bottles, or two liter soda bottles, and how to invert them to make, make hydroponics out of them. Um, when it comes to a lot of the food I grow here, like I said, corn, of course, beans, squashes. Uh, I brought back a squash, this squash right here. So this squash right here is actually a traditional Anishinaabe squash, white squash, it's a scallop, scallop squash. Usually you see these in the, the supermarket and they're yellow. These ones are white. So we grow a lot of these. And we, at the end, we, we use them, I give them away to my, to my volunteers, to the community, so they, they can eat and try this traditional food. So when it comes to traditional foods here, and I just talk about bringing foods back, one thing, one, well, I should say two, no, maybe three. So we did the wild rice, the squashes, then we have the pawpaw trees, and then we have ground nut. These are traditional foods I, I decided to bring back to, to the valley here in Toronto, but we can actually grow these, grow these in containers or rewild them so we can actually taste this food again. Um, the pawpaw is one of, our, one, of our, one of our only tropical fruits that grow this far north. And the thing with the pawpaw tree, the pawpaw fruit, is that when it ripens, you basically have two to three days to eat it before it rots on you. And it tastes like a cross between like pineapple, mango, with a little bit of lime with it. It's really good fruit. Makes really, really, really good ice cream and gelato. So if you ever get a chance, you're at any kind of supermarket in the future, look for pawpaws, try those, you're going to love them. Um, pawpaws, wild, wild strawberries we grow here. I tried growing wheat, so to make some bread but the squirrels and the birds got to the wheat as, as it was growing and then uh, it starts to form. All the birds came and ate all the wheat in the rye and I was like, no, no, but they need to eat as well. Besides just, besides doing farming, also do, we do some crafts as well, some traditional native crafts. So this is a, a birch bark holder for your, for your medicines or your berries, right? Made out of birch bark and just a little, some twigs at the side of it. Kind of fun. You use it as a boat as well. Sometimes <laughs> I have this. I just kind of put um, berries inside there from picking beans for the day. Put beans inside there like that. Kind of fun. I do. I I make sure I have a lot of fun here. Brick course. Make sure that's about teaching, teaching about gardening, especially the youth about where their food comes from, especially traditional indigenous foods. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you guys a quick little tour. You're going to come on a little tour with me. Nice. When I go outside, you guys will be inside, I'll be outside, and you'll see the grounds I take care of here at Brickworks. You guys ready? Let's go. Yeah. Now, Isaac, most of it's covered in snow right now. Yeah. Uh, but everything's sleeping and getting ready for the spring. Exactly. <laughs> And boys and girls, this is when we, when we, uh, you know, you guys can go to the Brickworks. Like if a March break, do you, you have anything? You'll be there on March break, going um, like it will be open, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah. So like if you guys are looking for something to do this March break, and uh, you can go to the Brickworks. Come on down to the Brickworks. Come on down. You can walk around. We have the, the park at the back. There's ponds. So we're gonna walk over here to behind me. Do, do, do. We're going back there. I realize there's no way to turn your camera around on this on this team's function, but that is totally cool. There isn't? There is not. I thought there was. But that's okay. I've done this a thousand times before. Okay. All right, my friends. Can you guys see behind me? Woo. Where am I? There, there we are. Yep. You see behind me? Yep. Yes. So that area back there, that's the, that's the Indigenous Agricultural Techniques Garden. So in this garden, this is where you're going to find the Three Sisters. You're going to find different kind of native plants that grow here because I only grow native plants. I do my best not to have invasive plants here because, as you need to know, invasive plants are actually destroying our ecosystem here. So we make sure I do that. And so this garden was started by me five five years ago. If you never, if you didn't see it, if you saw it before, it was basically just a bunch of leftover weeds, bramble, um, brambles, raspberries, just growing, growing wild. They asked me to take it over. I said, sure, as long as I could do what I want to do with it. So I made this garden into a place to come and hang out in. 
Usually in the summertime, there's nothing but vegetation. Right now, there are rabbit tracks everywhere. Rabbits everywhere, they're enjoying this. Plus, because I leave food up for them, because what I want them to do is I want them to leave their, their rabbit poop on, poop on the ground so that they can fertilize this area. All right? So walking through, walking through. I mean, wow, there's a lot of snow. If you can see behind me, yeah. if I can see, can you see the, the boxes back there? Yeah, yeah, right there. Okay, those are beehives. So we have beehives here on site as well. So the bees are allowed to go wherever they want to collect the pollen, come on back and turn it into honey. And so we have like amazing honey that is made here by these bees. And this year I'm gonna build a great, build a great big native bee hotel as well to create, make sure our native bees are taken care of. Because the honey, the honey making bees are just the European making bees, European bees. All right, we're gonna go to the food forest and back inside, woo hoo! It's actually fun walking outside. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. Not cold. Woohoo! Okay. We made it through the snow. All right. So behind me on this one, boom. See behind me here, you see the red the red barrels. Yes. So that right there, that is the food forest that I am creating here on site. So the food forest is going to be all native species, trees and shrubs that create food. And so this is just to showcase what we have here in the valley and to showcase what people can do back in at their own homes as well. I mean, all this there, there, forgot to show you the spot behind me right here. We see that black fence right there. That is, that is our ceremonial site. So we created that about four years ago with some funding. So this is where we have sweat lodges. We do um, naming ceremonies. Basically, you name it, we do it here now at Brickworks, especially, especially, especially for the Indigenous community, because one of my programs was to re-Indigenize Brickworks, which is what I'm doing. All right. So that was our quick little tour. We're going to head right back in. Hopefully you guys would have some questions generating in your little heads, but I'm going to keep on talking and talk about what else I do. So we talked about vermicomposting and the composting system which is amazing to do in your gardens, especially in your, your school gardens. Now we're gonna go back inside. And it'll be interesting to see as we work with you throughout the year to see the change from yes. the cold winter snow to the spring, <laughs> to the summer. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see the changes. It is a, it's a, such a big, beautiful change. Before I go on more on compost, remember we talked about the, um, the sun root? The sun choke we're making into bricks. Here it is. Right here. It's all dry. Can you hear that? Yeah. So this well, these long stems that go all the way down there are going to be made into bricks. That is our plan with those. So that's gonna be that's gonna be a lot of fun because we're here at Evergreen Brickworks and we don't we don't have any display and how the bricks were made. So now we should do something that when it comes to bricks, it should be natural bricks. All right, are we back here again? Awesome. Okay. Well, Go back inside. Yeah, sorry. Let me get this thing off. Okay, time check. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. Awesome. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Well, are there any questions right now? Okay, we have a few. So this is what you're going to do for questions. If you have a question, um, you can stand up, or if you're pretty close, you can just stand up and give me your question, or if you're in the back, you can move off to one of the corners. In there. Any questions? Sarah, stand on up. Say hi, Hello, and what's your question? Uh, nice and loud. It's about the bees. Oh, go ahead. About the bees. Now, hold on before I begin. Boys and girls, make sure if you're asking questions, make sure they're appropriate questions. And please make sure that you are asking nothing too personal, right? Go ahead, Sarah. So, do, these, like, do the bees still collect pollen in the winter or do they... What are the bees doing in the winter? Okay, so the bees are actually hibernating. Um, the queen is most likely probably reproducing as well. A lot of them are hibernating and eating whatever sugar, water, and honey, sweet stuff we put inside there for them to, to maintain their bodies for the winter time. Um, they do, whenever whenever there is a 
warm spell. You know, sometimes we have, we'll have that January thaw where things that are kind of warm. The bees actually come out. And they'll buzz around, like they clean their hive out, then they'll go back in and get cold. Yeah. They're, very, very, they're, they're actually very docile bees. There's many times I'm in the garden and the bees will just land on me and people are like, oh, a bees are on you. Yeah, they're fine. They won't bother you. They're just taking a break. You have another question, sir? Go ahead. Uh, so, like, once, you know, once it turns to, like, spring and then, like, the, uh, all the snow is gone and then the animals stop hibernating, like, how do the bees, where do the bees collect pollen, like, if, if the flowers are still growing? So where are they collecting the pollen in the springtime if the flowers are just starting to grow? Okay, so you have to know that there are some flowers that, that arrive before everything else. So well, actually one of the first, one of the very first flowers, first food source for bees are, are dandelions. Oh. Dandelions are one of, the, like, one of the very first food sources for bees. And so that's why I tell people when, when, when spring comes and, and you see the weeds, or we can't call them weeds, just plants behaving badly. Uh, when you see the dandelions grow, don't cut them. Let them grow, let them flower so that so the bees can come and the bees can actually have food. How's that? You have questions? Ms. Cooper. Hi, Isaac. Hi. I have um, a question regarding the clay pots because yep. I hear that the next step for my students is potentially doing some gardening. Oh. So I think I think that the clay pots is an excellent way that we could, especially in the courtyard mm -hmm. where they're not receiving um, water, rainwater consistently. So does the clay, does the water seep out through the clay pots? I'm assuming. Great question. So when you when you're doing your clay pots, okay. So you have, you have to make sure that the clay pots are non-glazed, totally natural. Because if they, if they are glazed, which means if they have paint on them and you put water in here, the water is not going to seep out. When the clay pot is natural with no paint or glaze on it, the water naturally slowly seeps, out, seeps through the clay into the soil. So if you're, when you have this in the ground and your soil, the soil is wet or damp around it, the water is actually going to stay inside here. But when the soil is nice, the soil is dry, the water starts to seep into the soil. And that's why we that's why it's allowing the, the plants to drink when they want to drink. When we are when we are watering our plants, we're actually forcing them to drink. That's what we're doing. Like here, here's some water, drink it right now. Whereas this method right here, you put the water in, put the cap on it, walk away, they will start drinking it when they need it. You see how much, much, and it's much less wasteful. Pardon me? It's much less waste, uh, wasteful. Exactly. Because, like, exactly. You just walk the whole garden. It's a lot of it's going to waste, where yes. this is concentrating in one spot. Exactly. And I I, I rewater them every four days. Okay. Just fill up the jugs. Just fill it up. Cool. Fill it up and walk away. Let Mother Nature take her course. You don't have to get up. Go ahead. What's your question? Wait, do flowers grow in the same pot? No, the flower, the go. Oh, do flowers grow in the grit in the in the clay pots? No, they do not. Um, unless you are going to use it for as a proper a proper flowering pot like this way, and have your flowers your soil far inside here. No, because you're not putting any soil inside here at all. Only water goes inside here. Water or your liquid fertilizers. Those are the only things that go inside here. If soil goes inside there, nothing nothing will grow. Another thing you do with these is that if you do it this way and you put, put a, a cork in the bottom, you put this whole thing in the ground, now you have a watering source for your squirrels, for the rabbits to come drink the water and stop eating all your plants around. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Sky, go ahead, give us a question, Sky. So okay. The seed, yes. All right. So these are made with clay, compost, water, and seeds. So you're going to take your compost, your clay, you're going to mix it together so your hands are all mucky up. And then what I what I do is I poke maybe one or two or three holes in the in this little ball right here and drop some seeds in there, some more compost, cover it up, let it dry. 
when I toss it, what's going to happen when it, when it starts to break down, if the water starts to seep inside the clay, when, when it starts to, when it hits the seed, the seed starts to germinate. As the seed is germinating, i.e. growing, it starts to feed off the compost that is stored inside here. So it has, it has a nice protective shell as it's growing nice and big inside until it's ready to pop out. Uh, what seeds do you generally put in there? So I put like asters, echinacea seeds, any native plant seeds. Any other questions? Oh yes, go ahead, Ebony. Uh, R. R. Sorry. My question is, uh, if you throw a seed bomb where the clay pot, um, the clay pot thing is, like the clay pot is, um, that gives off water, will, will it just work together? They would work together. They will help each other out. So if I put, if I had this in the ground, I put the, the uh, seed bombs around it, what will happen is that because, because this is nice soak, taking the water out, it will soak the seeds, the seed bombs, and start to germinate the seeds. Oh. You have another so, one? Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to like put dirt on the pots? You just throw them? You you, so do you have to put dirt on there on the seed things? So what you can do, you can actually do that one. Like you can take them and toss them wherever you want them or just take them and dig a hole and just drop them in where you want to put, put them as well. If I'm doing this method right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a hole and drop them inside the soil. All right. If I'm doing the other method, I'm just going to take them and toss them where I want them. Any questions? Jennifer? Um, I want to know how to make those bricks. She wants to know how to make those bricks. You want to know how to make the bricks? Do you want to, do you want to make some bricks? No, but like, <laughs> it'll be a big help for my backyard. Ooh. Okay, so actually what I can do is I can actually send your teacher a link in the recipe of the brick. Cool. Well, uh, we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Last one. And then uh, we'll have a quick talk and then we have to get moving. What type of clay should we use? Great for question. The, um, seed bombs? Okay, so you're going to use food quality clay. Our clay is a red clay like the terracotta clay. If you look, this has like a red tinge to it. Where is that camera? All right, but it's food grade, which means that if you accidentally get it inside your mouth, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you. Dina? Uh, you inspired me to um, start uh, like planting. Uh, You've inspired him to start planting, he says. <laughs> nice. Nice. You need to know where your food's coming from. And planting gardening is a great way to do that and a great way to be nice and calm and connect. We're, we're looking forward to working with you throughout this year. I know um, you and I are going to be talking about um, what type of uh, techniques and uh, gardening and we're using your expertise to uh, walk us through the seedling process and the planting process later in June. So we are excited to work with you and uh, take some of the great work that you do there at the uh, Evergreen Brickworks and apply it here at school. And hopefully our, even our backyards are in our houses. All right. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, sir. And we will uh, see you in just a few minutes with group two. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. -bye. bye, -bye.